have been in this Lenten sermon series called Jesus is the Way. What does it mean to follow the way of the cross? Not just as a guideline to a historical document of Jesus' final days and weeks, but what does it mean for us to live out the way of the cross? We've been studying throughout this thing called the journey narrative, Luke's gospel from 9 through Luke 19. Jesus' journey to the cross, his final road to the cross. What does it mean for us to value our own participation and recognize that our participation changes everything? Not just our belief, not just saying the things we're supposed to say, but actually participating in the things that Jesus calls us to do. That's where we have been the last several weeks, and we'll be there today, and we'll wrap up this series tomorrow. We are going to be in two places if you want to get your Bibles out. We're in Luke 19, and going to go back to Luke 13 for a minute, about halfway through as well. So I want to invite you to pull your Bibles out and get there. We're going to be in Luke 19, the second half of that chapter. Now, if you turn to Luke 19, you'll realize that this is a very familiar passage to most. It is the Palm Sunday narrative, the story we would usually read on Palm Sunday, which is next week, and we will read it next week on Palm Sunday. But in preparing this service, there was a part of this story that I think we often neglect and miss out on. I wanted to hit today, before we get to the full-throttle joy of Palm Sunday. If you don't know the story, you don't remember the story, let me recap it briefly for you. Jesus has finally gotten to Jerusalem. This final journey is coming to an end. He's almost there. He asks the disciples to go and get a colt, to get a donkey. They go and get the donkey. He rides the donkey into Jerusalem. There are palm, there are coats on the ground, there are palm fronds waving. It is a scene of absolute joy. And that's where we pick the story up in Luke 19, verse 37. Here's what it says. When he, Jesus, came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. But some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, Jesus replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. And said, if you, if even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes. You get a sense in this story of where the people are, right? Of of the the excitement that is building. They're ready to crown Jesus king right there, right then, on the road to Jerusalem. Jesus is the guy. This excitement is swelling. The energy is building. And it's getting so big that Jesus says, even if they stopped right now, even the rocks would cry out. You feel that electricity, right? Store that away. We're going to come back to that next week. But here's the part that I think is so interesting. All of this is going on around Jesus, and, but Jesus doesn't seem to be excited. Jesus doesn't seem to want to get in on the party. Instead of buying into the hype, what does Jesus do? He weeps. He, says he wept over Jerusalem. And literally in the Greek here, this word weep means to weep bitterly. It is a sign of pain and of grief. This word is only used in one other place in the New Testament, in the Gospels. It is not, and it is not, what's the, anyone know what the shortest verse in the Bible is? Jesus wept, John eleven thirty five. It is not there that this word is used. That is a different word. That means silently crying, just like kind of sad. This word to weep bitterly, the only other place we find this word in Scripture. I want you to fast forward in your mind to the passion story. When Jesus tells Peter that Peter's going to deny him three times. And Peter's outside of Caiaphas' house. And he's denied Jesus the third time. And Jesus walks by and says, the Lord looked at Peter. And Peter realized and remembered what Jesus had said. And Peter wept bitterly. That's the kind of weeping we're talking about. This isn't you just watched a notebook kind of movie and you're kind of sobbing a little bit. This is ugly crying. This is visceral crying. He's weeping over the city. You'd think this procession, this Palm Sunday moment is the highlight of Jesus' ministry. The people finally recognize he is the Messiah. He is the King of Kings. They're ready to crown him right there. But Jesus knew something they didn't know. He saw something they didn't see. 
something wasn't right. And in verse 42, we go back to that. It says, if you had only known what would bring you peace. This crowd is all fired up. They're all excited. But Jesus knows they still don't get it. They still don't understand. There's a severe misunderstanding for what it means for Jesus to be the Messiah. For what it means for Jesus to be the king and what kind of kingdom he's bringing with him. And he's right. Because of course in a couple of days, if we fast forward down the passion narrative, Jesus' final days, what does that same crowd shout a few days later? Crucify him. Crucify him. Jesus goes on in verse 43, the, the next verse in that passage, and he says, the days will come upon you, he's speaking prophecy, the days will come upon you when the enemies will build an embankment against you, and they will encircle you, and they will hem you in on every side. They will not leave, they will dash you to the ground, you and your children within the walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time that God came for you. Now in this time of Jesus' time in the first century, the Jewish folks, the Israelites, are enslaved or oppressed by the Roman Empire. The Rome has control, and the Rome, Rome's the good guys, right? Wake up, y'all. Rome, Rome's not the good guys. Right? Rome's not nice. They're cruel. And there had been opportunity after opportunity where for, throughout history, we, in recorded history like Josephus and other historical sources, Throughout the first century, we see attempt after attempt after attempt by the Jewish people to revolt against the Roman authorities. In fact, when Jesus was just a little boy, there was a revolt that was led against the Romans. And as a result, as a punishment for those who revolted, there was a mass crucifixion in Jesus' hometown. So Jesus, as a little boy, is walking through the streets of his hometown and will have seen all these folks who followed a false Messiah who promised deliverance crucified on the side of the road by the Roman authorities. And over and over in the Gospels, we see Jesus warning the people, if you're going to keep going down this road, if you're going to keep trying to pursue this new kingdom through violence, it's not going to end well for you. It's going to end in destruction. And of course, that prophecy is eventually fulfilled about 40 years after Jesus goes to the cross. In 70 AD, the Romans finally have had enough of the Israelites. They bring their army to bear on Jerusalem. They sack Jerusalem. They don't leave a single stone on top of another stone. They burn the temple. And according to the historian Josephus, over a million people were killed in this cleansing. They didn't get it. They so desperately wanted a king, and Jesus was the king. Jesus was the Messiah come to save them and set things right. But he wasn't doing it with an army. And he wasn't doing it through political means. He wasn't doing it as a way to gain notoriety. He did it on a donkey and on a cross. Now there are so many things we could chew on here. This is, that kind of topic is a preacher's delight. right? But the one thing I want to point out, because as I read this text in preparing for the Lent sermon series, something grabbed me. You ever read the same text over and over again and you, all of a sudden you realize something you never noticed before? That's the part we just read. We skip over it. It's the tears of Jesus. The tears of the Messiah, I think, are at the heart of what it means to have a gospel. You can't separate Jesus' words from his tears. This word of warning, this prophecy he delivers is not out of anger. It's not out of some stern, cold heart. It's not out of some kind of retribution for the people not getting it. It's not revenge. It comes through tears. It comes from a broken heart from a place of love and of compassion for these folk. And for us, Jesus is not okay with the fact that things are not okay. See, the way of the cross ultimately is the way of love and is the way of compassion. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. What does it mean for us to walk in the way of compassion? The word compassion shows up about a handful of times in the Gospels. And one of my favorite places it shows up is in Mark's Gospel. In Mark 6, Mark's version of the feeding of the 5,000. It says in verse 34 that Jesus saw the large crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And this word in the Greek for compassion is one of my favorite Greek words. It's so fun to say. It's splachnon. You'll say splachnon. Splachnon. If we ever have a Rottweiler deer, I want to name it splachnon. Okay? Here's my buddy splachnon. 
Nobody, nobody will know it means compassion, but they'll think it's a fearsome name. And this word literally means gut-level compassion. It comes from the root that means your innards, your guts. And it seems a little strange, but think about it. When you hear of somebody you know or love who's going through a bad time, where do you feel that compassion? You feel it inside, at our very core. And God, according to Paul in 2 Corinthians, is the father of all compassion. He feels it in his guts. He feels it in a visceral way. He feels, it, he feels the brokenness of this world. This world that God loves so much, but when it comes to the mess that we live in, Jesus reveals to us a God who doesn't stand off at a distance, but a God who comes down into the midst of that mess, who takes on flesh so he can feel it himself. Sometimes we forget that Jesus was both fully divine and fully human. Jesus would have felt that compassion in his gut. That's the kind of God we serve, a God who's invested who's involved, is emotionally invested in who we are and what's going on. And when it comes to the mess of the world, our God is a God of compassion. And at the heart of this compassion, is, it's all over the place in Luke's gospel, maybe more so than anywhere else in the gospels. Because in Luke's gospel, every, with the exception of the story of Zacchaeus, who does Jesus spend his time with? The poor, the downtrodden, the marginalized, the sick, the outcast, the people that nobody else wants to hang out with. Over and over again in Luke's gospel, we see Jesus extending his hand out to them, engaging with the folks that nobody else would. One of my favorite encounters in the gospels is in Luke's gospel, in the journey narrative in Luke 13. If you flip over to Luke 13, you'll see it about halfway through the chapter. And it's this encounter where Jesus encounters this woman who's been crippled by the Spirit for 18 years, by a spirit, by Satan. She's crippled, so she's walking over with a, with a hunch, and she's been doing it for 18 years. And Jesus tells us that it, this is this way because the accuser, Satan, has had her wrapped up for all that time. Now, in her society in the first century, that's not how they would have viewed it. They would have looked at that affliction and said, what's wrong with you? What did you do to deserve that? You must have done something untoward to be afflicted like this, or somebody in your family did something for you to be afflicted like this. This is God getting back at you. But Jesus knows the truth. Jesus knows that this is not something somebody would choose. This illness is not a form of divine justice. And because that's how people saw her, she was labeled unclean, unable to participate in the life of the community. And then in verse 12 of Luke 13, Jesus says this. Or it says this. It says, when Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity." When Jesus saw her, I wonder how long it had been since anybody else had seen that woman, truly seen her. Much like in our day, folks who are marginalized on the outside of society, who live on the fringes, they tend to blend into the social landscape, they tend to be forgotten about. But Jesus saw her. He looked at her with eyes of compassion. And in doing that, he knew she was so much more than the assumptions the world made about her. The overly simplistic definitions they put on her. Jesus knew who she was and whose she was. And he calls her daughter. And later in the, in the passage, he calls her a daughter of Abraham. If you are here last week, we talked about Zacchaeus. And that moment in Zacchaeus' story when Jesus turns and calls Zacchaeus the most reviled man in all of Jericho and calls him a son of Abraham. Saying he's part of the crowd he's part of the faith community no matter what you think about him and in the same way he calls this woman a daughter of abraham and he begins to set things right with her you remember the series we did in february called names of god anybody remember that series one of the names of god is the god who sees me Does anybody remember which name that was el rai not el roy but el rai the god who sees me and there's folks today here online who need to hear that. God sees you. God sees all the things that make you great. God sees all the things that make us not great. He knows everything that's happened to us, everything we've said, everything we've done, everything we've thought, and yet he still sees us and desires us to be his own. It doesn't scare him away. It's in that place when we start to understand that, we, we start to realize that we can't hide. Hiding from God doesn't do any good anyway, right? God will always find us. But we stop running and trying to hide. 
We allow God to see us. We allow ourselves to be seen so that God can call us in a new direction. And that's where we begin to experience God's healing presence in our life. Now again, I could spend the rest of the morning there too. But the sermon series is about the way of the cross. So let's spin that forward. What's the way that we're then called to follow? Well, here's the question I want to ask you this morning. Who are you weeping for? Who are you losing sleep over? What are you losing sleep over? Who are you weeping for? We're called to be people who pick up our cross, who follow Jesus, who demonstrate the very compassion that Jesus shows to us. So who do you see? Who or what are you weeping for? The thing about compassion is compassion requires proximity. Compassion requires us to get up close and personal with somebody or something. To feel it in your guts, there has to be a personal connection. Compassion is not something you can do from a distance. Back in college, when I was short on cash and long on time, uh, I had a Jeep Cherokee that didn't get very good fuel mileage. Because my dad, in his infinite wisdom, had put a lovely exhaust system on this car uh, that was not meant for a Jeep, it was meant for a sports car. And I burned a lot more gas than I needed to burn back in the day. But I used to play this game running around the Midlands of South Carolina of how far can I go until I have to put gas in this thing? How low can that gauge get before I have to put gas in this thing? Anybody ever play that game? Yeah. My rule was this. If the light doesn't come on, it doesn't need gas. I knew exactly how far I had left when that light came on before I had to get to a gas station. Don't ask me how I knew that, but I knew that. And I would run around town, I would stop, I just would make sure I wasn't paying any attention to how much I had left. I didn't want to have to worry about when I was going to need gas. I'd just wait for that little light to come on and then I'd worry about it. I'd cover it up and make sure I, I don't have to think about it, I don't have to see it, I don't have to worry about it because it's not in my field of vision. How many of us that describes the way we engage with the world around us. If I don't have to see it, I don't feel bad about it. If I don't have to engage with it, I don't feel bad about it. If I don't feel bad about it, then I don't have to do anything about it. I saw a church sign that's one of those changeable signs like we have that somebody posted online the other day, and it said it shouldn't have to happen to you for it to matter to you. Think about that. It shouldn't have to happen to you for it to matter to you. We live in a culture that is obsessed with telling us to spend our energy and our time and our treasure on everything we can do to insulate ourselves. Can you isolate yourselves from everything else going on? Distract yourself from those things. Hey, you you feel a little empty about your life? Why don't you go on a shopping spree? Why don't you go on a vacation? Why don't you do this this kind of therapy where you just uh, acquire things? But what ends up happening is all we do is get distracted. We get sucked into a bunch of stuff that really doesn't matter. As I was engaging with this, a question hit me this week for, in my life, and maybe it applies to you too. Why is it that this week I know more about what's going on in Washington National Spring Training Camp, or I know more about my March Madness bracket than I know about what's going on in Ukraine? Why? Why is that? It's a luxury we have. We're, we can afford to be distracted because it doesn't matter to us if we don't have to see it. And some of us, we know more about our favorite TV shows than we know about what's going on outside our front door. And we get sucked into the stuff and we numb ourselves with it. We insulate ourselves so we don't have to feel any of it. But the way of the cross, the way of compassion, leads us right into the middle of it. Who are you weeping for? What are you weeping for? What are you losing sleep over? We've got to be close to it. We've got to have proximity to it. And the new life that Jesus offers us, this abundant life in us and the work that God wants to do through us, that stuff really begins with this sense of disruption. When we realize we can't play those games anymore. We can't afford to distract ourselves anymore. Brackets don't seem to matter that much anymore. But what some of us need more than anything else is for God to mess us up, for God to disrupt us. Because the truth is we've been distracted by a bunch of stuff that doesn't really matter. Compassion is about those things and those people all around us. Not just reading stories in the news. Not just seeing news stories, 30 second clips. Not just seeing statistics. But about those in our neighborhoods who are hurting. The ones who in our neighborhood in the cold we had last weekend are out there without a house 
who are trapped in domestic violence and abuse. The ones who are suffering through cycles of addiction and disease. The children who go to bed hungry every night. The children for whom spring break is not something to look forward to because they won't have food during the week because they're not at school. Those things, the, the children around the world who die because they don't have access to clean water. Something we take for granted when we take our cup and we go to the refrigerator in the morning. These things, these, th- these people, they're not things to be solved. They're not problems to be fixed. They're not just numbers on a page. They're not things that, hey, somebody should do something about that somewhere, someday. They're beloved brothers and sisters, children of God, who are in need of love, grace, mercy, and compassion. Which leads to our next question. Who are you weeping for, and what are you going to do about it? Because see, compassion also requires passion. Compassion isn't sympathy. Compassion isn't empathy. It's not just feeling bad about something. Compassion is where sympathy stops. Compassion keeps going. Where empathy runs out, compassion keeps going. It requires action. It requires sacrifice. This word passion, if you go back to the roots of the word passion, you know the first time the word passion was ever used to describe Jesus' final days? That's where we get the term the passion of the Christ from. It's about suffering, about sacrifice. What about our commitment to the world is costing us anything? Where are you bleeding for the cross right now? If you took inventory of your life, if you looked at how you spend your time, your energy, your money, your resources, is it for your kingdom or is it for God's kingdom? Are we giving Jesus loose change or are we giving back to Jesus everything that's his, which includes our whole lives? See, Jesus invites us. Jesus invites us to take up our cross. The very beginning of the series, the beginning of the journey narrative starts with Jesus saying to his disciples, take up your cross and follow me. And it's more than just bearing up the difficult things of life. I hear people say all the time, it's one of my pet peeves, say, you know, I've been bearing my cross. I had a flat tire yesterday. I've got to go to my in-laws tomorrow. Pray for me. I'll pray for you. But that's not bearing our cross. That's just life being life. Taking up our cross is about asking God how far are we willing to go in order to help rescue the world and to show the world the love that God has shown us. Taking up our cross is about following Jesus into the broken parts of the world and partnering with him to help put those pieces back together. What does that look like? And the beauty of being a church, of being Christ's body on earth, is that we get to be a part of that. We get to be a part of putting those pieces back together. We have, look around the room, look around who's online in the chat this morning. We have resources. We have creativity. We have means. We have God-given gifts and abilities to think about how do we use those things to provide compassion to the world around us. But it's not just doing things, because that too quickly can become us reaching down and saying, let me fix this for you. It's also about relationships. Because the only way out of poverty, whether it's financial poverty or spiritual poverty, the only way out of poverty is through building relationships. And the thing about relationships is that when we build them, they have to be genuine. They can't be transactional. They can't be, hey, I'm going to go do this for you to help you. I expect to see you in church next Sunday. They can't be, I'm going to do this for you. I expect you to to give back to the church. They can't be, I'm going to go serve. I'm going to sit with you. I'm going to love you. And I expect you to tell everybody about how great our church is because of that. It can't be transactional. It has to be agape, selfless, sacrificial love, genuinely caring for somebody. And if we do that, God can not only use us to do amazing things for the world, but God can change us. Because participation does change everything, not just about that around us, but changes what's in here. And Jesus is calling us to live this cruciform, cross way of life. He's not trying to call us into a miserable existence or needless suffering where we just don't have any fun. Jesus is calling us into this relationship to rescue us, to rescue us from our indifference, from our greed, from our obsession with routine and schedule, from a life that is void of meaning. Back when I coached in Ashburn, I used to coach high school basketball. And I lived at the time for a couple of times years I coached. I lived in Fairfax, then I lived in Gainesville. 
Does anyone know how you get to Ashburn from Gainesville or from Fairfax? It's the same way. 66, yeah, Susan knows. It's 66 and 28. So when we would have morning practice before school, we'd have afternoon practice, it would be right after school. No matter what time of day that was, I was going to have to come home and rush hour traffic. So I would often kill time at one of the local bagel shops in Ashburn because I realized that I could spend two hours in the car or I could wait an hour and then spend an hour in the car and not be in my car. So I'd go to the coffee shop, bagel shop all the time. And there was a group of guys who met at this particular bagel shop and they were probably six or seven older guys, all retirees, I assume. And they met there, you'd see them all the time. And one day they were sitting there together and this guy comes in. I don't know, let's call him Joe because I don't, well, don't remember his name was. But he comes in and he says, hey, Joe, how you been? Where have you been? What you been doing? We missed you. We didn't think you were coming today. What have you been doing today? And he said, nothing. Absolutely nothing. And they gave him a hard time. And they said, there's no way. Like, you had to do, what did you do? You did something, right? He said, no, I did absolutely nothing. When I retired, I meant it. Now, I don't want to judge Joe. I don't want to judge this group of guys. But I don't want to get to a point in my life where the highlight of my week is going for a, a meaningless hour at a bagel shop where I don't do anything. I don't want the highlight of my life to be at any point sitting down and watching one TV program. I don't want to get to the point where all my energy and all my time and all my effort is engaged in managing my IRA or my 401k. Because Jesus Christ called us to do so much more than that. No matter whether you're 5 or you're 85. And I wonder what would happen to the church, even if just in America, if the church would wake up and realize that Jesus Christ has called us to a life of a way of the cross, not just easy believism, not cheap grace, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer would say, but to radical discipleship, to truly taking up our cross and following Jesus, not into our churches, but following Jesus into the broken parts of the world and partnering with him to put those back together. I love the kind of world that would create and I don't know where you are with this. Maybe you're sitting with this and you're, you're super empowered by it. Maybe you're going, what in the world? But as we get ready to head to Holy Week, as we celebrate the triumphal entry, as we celebrate all the things that come in Holy Week, we celebrate the resurrection. How is this going to manifest itself in your life? It's too easy to get lost in a celebration and forget the way that we're called to continue to walk. But I, but I hope what I know is that our hope in this world is not in the fact the world can change. What I love is the fact that our hope is in the realization that the world has already changed. We serve a risen Lord. We go through Good Friday, the beautiful services on Good Friday, where we're reminded of Jesus' final words and the final moments, the holiest day of the year when Jesus died for your sins and for mine. But do you know why it means so much? Because Sunday's coming. Because we know that Jesus walked out of that tomb. The tomb's already empty. Jesus is risen from the dead. How do we take that confidence with us into the broken places of our community and of our world so we can partner with God to help make things right? Over the last several months or so, starting back in October, your leadership board, our, our governing body of the church, have been working to discern and to hear from God what the mission of, in this season of life for Buckhall Church, what the mission is beyond just the Great Commission. What does it look like for the Buckhall Church to, to do the things God has called us to do? And I was going to wait and uh, spring this and kind of put this out there after Easter, but it fit so well with today's conversation. And here's what that, that mission and vision statement is. Buckhall Church's mission is to bring our community closer to Jesus Christ and each other through service and sharing the love of God with all. See that blending of love of God and love of neighbor? Blended in with a sense of not just being watchers, but being active participants, both in the gospel and in the community. One foot in one and one foot in the other. Going out and taking the love and the compassion of God and sharing it with the world. Not so that they would come into our pews. If they do, that's great. But that's not why we do it. We do it because we desire the world to know the love of God that we know. And I want to be a part of that kind of church. I hope you do too. We can do it. We can make a difference. I heard a speaker at my conference this week say, if you're in a small church, and we're not a small church, but if you're in a small church, and you doubt your capacity to change the world, ask yourself this question. Is your church bigger than a mustard seed? 
If it's bigger than a mustard seed, you can move mountains. We can change our community. We can change our world with the power of the Holy Spirit. We can do that. And I want you to prayerfully consider how you can be a part of that. How can you do that? Because guess what? You're bigger than a mustard seed too. Maybe it's as simple as I ask. Maybe I ask you, what are you weeping for? And you don't have an answer to that question. You've never really thought about that before. That's okay. But what's not okay is to not have an answer to that question and not ask God to do something about that. Not invite God to open your eyes. I'd encourage you this week, or if you're on spring break in, in a couple of weeks, Take a walk around your neighborhood. Take a walk around the community. Drive down to Manassas and pick a neighborhood and walk around. Ask God to help you see things and to see people the way he sees them. What are the things you've never seen, the things you've never noticed, the people you've never noticed? And when you begin to feel that disruption, that visceral compassion, don't look away. Don't walk away from it. Take a step into it. Take a step towards it. Lean into it. And trust that God will do something great, something amazing with you in the midst of what it is he's breaking your heart for. Would you pray with me? Let's pray. God, we thank you. We thank you for the cross. Not just for the the physical implement and for what it represents, but for the way of the cross. Thank you for Jesus. And we thank you for your spirit and for what you're continuing to do even today in and amongst us. I thank you for the folks who are hearing this word today, Lord. I pray that for all of us who need it, that you would disrupt us, that you would mess us up, stir up that compassion in us, rescue us from our idleness, from our comfort, from our routines and break our hearts for the things that break yours help us to see people in this world not as others or as things to be solved but to see them as beloved brothers and sisters of God help us to follow you help us to embrace the cross as a way of life we love you God and we love you Jesus we pray all these things in your name Amen and amen.